On any given day, there are 2.7 million children who currently have a parent incarcerated in America. And over 10 million people have experienced a parent behind bars at some point in their lives. This is not a unique story. This is a part of the American story. From the lenses of young adults, this podcast explores the harm of poverty, mass incarceration, the beauty and resilient relationships, and the pain of fractured wounds. Join our co-hosts as they enter the sanctuary with our guests in this episode of If You Only Knew. What if I told you that everything that glitter is not good? Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good night. Whatever time you're watching this, thank you for coming. Welcome to our sanctuary. Thank you, Amari, for being here, being open, being willing to, you know, invite us into your story and just get deeper, get more in tune with you. Thanks for having me. If only you knew that I almost gave up. Um, A little by myself is that I live in Washington, D.C. I was born and raised there. And I went to a very good high school in D.C., um, Benjamin Banneker, and that's how I kind of got involved in scholarships, which is an organization that's for students with incarcerated parents. And that's how I'm here today um, through Miss Yasmin. And a little bit background about myself is just that when my dad left away, um, everything kind of changed as far as education, my health, my community, my financial situation. Um, And to give you a little detail about that, I had really bad heart and lung issues. So I was going to the hospital, being admitted into the intensive care unit maybe once a month. So being at Banneker, which is a very challenging academic school, it was hard and it was exhausting and I wanted to transfer. I wanted to leave because Banneker is just so demanding with the homework and the course load in itself. And being sick, it was just not a good mix. So I started to do things like tell my mom that I was okay, that I was feeling fine because I felt like it was so much pressure on her as now I have a single mom of three. Um, I didn't want her to always miss work because I was sick so much. So like with my dad leaving, that just put so much on her. Um, As far as like my stepdad, when my dad went to prison, my stepdad had got murdered. So that was just like really my mom, my mom, my mom, my mom, and just us. So it was just like a constant battle of like, from the outside, my life looks really well, you know, like I'm in school, I have a nonprofit, I'm really involved in the community, but if you take the time, you know, to see me when I'm not good, it's just like, everything is not how it looks on the exterior. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. I feel like we're very similar in our academics and the way we prioritize that, you know, we've dedicated ourselves to education from a very young age. That is mm-hmm. that is our home. That is, I don't wanna say it's a safe space, but it's the, the place where, you know, we spend a lot of our time and yeah. we come home and we spend more time doing that. Mm-hmm. So I guess one question that I have for you, because it's a question I always ask myself, if you didn't, you know, have this drive or you didn't have school to be, you know, that home away from home, what do you think you would have spent your time doing or more so, how do you think you would have dealt with, you know, the cars that were given to you? Mm, nice question. Um, I honestly don't think that school was my home away from home because before I feel like now and we're living in a pandemic and everyone is experiencing virtual school, mm-hmm. virtual learning, that was really been my reality. I started asking my teachers, like, can one of my classmates who were in a lot of my classes, can they carry around a laptop to, um, we had, it was Uvu and then it oh, was yeah, like yeah. Um, something else. Yeah, I think it was just Uru. (laughs) And I used to really, oh, Skype, that's what it was. I was Skyping into my classes from the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the hospital was more so my home than school was because Mm -hmm. I was at school at the hospital. Like, and even when I was discharged, I would have to go home and do more schoolwork because I didn't want to fall behind. I didn't want to like, and at Banneker, there's like a, you know, there's a wall that shows your GPA if you make the honor roll, and it's like from highest to lowest. Yep. And I was always like, I have really bad fear of failure, and I just always thought I had to be like one of the top people on the list. So I didn't want my health or anything that was going on outside of school mm-hmm. to really make me not get on the list at all or not to be high on the list. So I think it was like an ego thing, honestly. Mm-hmm. I just didn't want 
to be looked at as like, oh yeah, Amari's sick, so she's doing well, she's doing bad at school. Like I never wanted to be an excuse. So I feel like my mm-hmm. home that was not like my actual house was definitely George's hospital. Yeah. And I wanna thank you for like correcting me in that and you know, letting people know that this was your reality. Like yeah. yes, you were, you know, a high performer, like that's what you are even now. I try. <laughs> <laughs> I like, try to be. Yeah, and I I, I respect you for correcting me, but also like letting it be known that yes, I was sick and yes, that was my home, but that didn't stop me at all. Mm, thank you. And I, I feel like at the same time, you know, um, I could say that you were trying to prove something to yourself, you know, trying to put yourself in a, in a high league, you know, trying to make yourself look like, regardless of what the situation was, you're trying to continue and strive for, you know, better on yourself. Mm-hmm. You know? I think honestly, like saying that just made me think something that we talked about before was that I wasn't really trying to prove anything to myself. I think I was more so trying to prove things to the people around me. Mm-hmm. Like I come from a neighborhood in Southeast that in DC um, is one of the worst neighborhoods that's in DC as a whole, not even just Southeast where we have like the highest rate of homicides, the highest rate of incarceration, the highest rate of like STDs, teen pregnancies, dropouts and things like that. And I was always, my mom did a really great job at always putting me in schools that kind of distracted me Mm -hmm. from my home in a sort. So I feel like I was more so trying to prove myself to my community and my family because it was just like, they put me on this pedestal of like, oh, you're doing this, you're doing that. So I didn't want to get into these these positions and then kind of feel in a sort. Even though if I would have got like a 3.0, I'm pretty sure my mom wouldn't have not you know, made a big deal about it, but I feel like to me, I would have looked at it as like, oh, that's pretty average. Cause a lot of people are bad they're not good at 3.0s. It's like everybody has a 3.7 or higher. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I was more so trying to prove myself to the people in my community and my family. Yeah, I actually want to tap into that, you know, doing things not entirely for yourself and, you know, just being, I don't want to say caricature, but you know, mm-hmm. just like this inanimate, you know, figure yeah. to somebody else. If you had to expose yourself, for lack of a better term, to these communities, what picture would you paint? Um, that's a good question. I would say that the thing I try to tell myself all the time is that it's good to not judge a book by its cover. I would just want to be painted as a person that has like no judgment at all and just mm-hmm. like very diverse. I like that a lot about, like whenever I talk about myself, it's kind of the only positive trait I say about myself is that I'm a diverse person. Mm -hmm. I like to go in the community and like, I used to be very ashamed to say that, I wasn't ashamed, but I also didn't talk about my dad being incarcerated. It wasn't something that I ever told anybody, like Mm -hmm. anybody at my school, I mean, if if you weren't in my community, then you didn't know. know, So it was just like, you know, all my friends' fathers, they were around, so. I never wanted to talk about it. So I feel like if I was to paint myself as this picture, I would now put in like the bonds of incarceration and what it does to the body and the families. I'll put in health, like my health has made me want to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm like in school for now. I'll put that, I'll put family pictures and colors of like, I'm really big on like the intersectionality of black women Mm -hmm. and the things that they go through. So I'll talk about that in there. I just want the picture to be like multiple different symbols all mm-hmm. thrown in one because I think that, you know, whenever we walk into different rooms, I need to talk about something different or adjust, the, adjust my tone of my conversation mm-hmm. for those who are listening because not everybody may understand, you know, living in Southeast DC because they don't live mm-hmm. there. So I think yeah. that'll be my pictures. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Another question, you know, I want to get into is what is like your family situation right now? Um, I know it's always been your mom, and I think that's something that we share. Mm-hmm. I think that's what all of us share, honestly. It's always just been that single family home. So I know you and your mom have a strong relationship. You know, does that extend today? Um, are you in communication with your dad? Like, is that relationship bonding? And how is that shaping you in womanhood? Like, you're an mm-hmm. adult, mm-hmm. you're going into grad school. It's not oh, I miss my dad because he didn't come to the father-daughter dance. It's like, no, I'm a grown woman paying bills and I've been doing this all alone ever since. And I still don't, you know, have that fatherly upbringing. I didn't heal that inner child. I didn't have those experiences. Mm. So how 
are both of your parents, you know, in your life today, if they are in your life today? Yeah, so that's not my reality at all. Like, I have not grown up in a single home, like single mother home. I always just live with my mom. Like, my parents were another together, but my dad was very a part of my life. So I give all the credit to both of my parents. Like, I was so blessed to have my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad was incarcerated, and he missed a lot of the big moments of my life, like mm -hmm. prom, graduation, going to college, and things like that. But my dad has always been, like, my Superman. Like, if I was to write a book about a superhero, then, like, it would be my father. Um, I always saw my dad to be, like, the God form mm -hmm. in human, honestly. Like, I didn't see anything wrong that he did. I just know I had a per like, to me, my life was perfect. My dad dropped me off at school. I got picked up from school. I didn't have to get on the train, like Metro, stuff like that in DC. Mm -hmm. I had lunch money all the time. Um, I like nice things, I'm not gonna lie. My dad was always <laughs> able to buy me whatever I wanted, when I wanted. Um, a lot of things I didn't even know about, but it's like my dad wore it, so I wore it too. Um, we had season tickets to football seasons, the Redskins. I'm not a Redskins fan, but we had season tickets to the Redskins <laughs> game because my dad likes football. We went to go see the Wizards all the time. We'll like go to Ruth Chris for a happy hour, then go to the basketball games. We went to the baseball games. Like my dad was a girl dad. Like if you ask him, we have a good bond. Like my mom and my dad, and they're really good friends. And because of their friendship, I feel like allowed my mom to still, you know, like. I'm not really close with my dad side of the family, but like me and my father, like that's really my road dog. So I'm so glad that he's home now. Mm -hmm. He got released. So he was able to see my college graduation and that meant the world to me because it was just like, woo, like this is bigger than high <laughs> yeah. school. Like this is the one here. So just to see my dad home now, he's on 24 hour house arrest. So he's not a, like officially home home, but mm -hmm. to be able to call him when I want, send him text messages when I want, I, I adore that. Like it's everything that I that I missed that I kind of I wanted for so long when mm -hmm. I was graduated, like especially college. It was just it was it's a stressful. moment when I was just depressed in school. And I'm just like I want to talk to my dad about this because we're close. But you know you only have a certain amount of calls that you can get if the jail's on lockdown and he's not yeah. gonna call. Like you can't visit sometimes because I'm at Penn State and he's across the country, so I can't just up and leave school when I got. My class load. Got deadlines. I'm in, right. You're I got woman. my internships. I'm in organizations. Like mm -hmm. I'm busy and I wanted to make time for my dad too, but I couldn't leave campus a lot. So it was just like that. So funny that yesterday my dad, he took, because he have like passes sometimes when he can come out of the house. And he took my little, I have a younger brother. Um, I think he's like seven. He took him to six. Mind you, my dad's been in jail my brother's whole entire life. Like they just met when he got released. Um, so he took him to Six Flags, which is like a regular amusement park, and he got in trouble because it was out of the boundaries. In D.C., there's like really thin lines of where it's D.C. and Maryland and mm -hmm. Virginia. Like on, you could be on the same street and one side is D.C. and one side is Maryland. So it's just like, is it's it that deep? Really so I know, feel yeah. like, you know, like the system, those are those bonds that I would talk about in my picture that mm -hmm. needs to be broken because it needs work. Yeah, and like all those side characters, they're not really on the side. Like, even yeah. though you might not have direct communication, they're going to influence you no matter how many miles they are mm -hmm. or the fact that, you know, they're not right next to you all the time. Like, they impact your story. And I think what you're trying to get at is, you know, like the main, like you have main character energy. I don't know if you guys get that reference, but it's, it's always been that main character energy. And I think, you know, what you're trying to get at is, there's more than just me. There's just more me. than, you know, me giving to my community, being a figure for them mm -hmm. and being a representative. Like, no, I, I'm i a village. And just yeah. because you don't see that village doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right, right. Speaking of like who I am and like the village, I try that now. Like I have a nonprofit called Susan Souls. And I basically started that one for, well, it's for children that has experienced some sort of trauma um, in Ward 8, D.C., because there's a lot that goes on in Ward 8. Like, my brother was five when his dad was murdered, and I feel like my mom couldn't really help him because she was grieving herself, and she didn't, you know, in the black community, we don't talk about mental health. We don't really talk yeah. about depression. Remember I told my mom I was depressed one day, she was like, you got everything going for you. You got Penn State for free, and I'm just like, mom. That's but, not it. That's not everything. That's a lot, but it ain't all. Like, I still got to think about what's next, you know, and 
even if you have everything, you still could be missing, you mm-hmm. know, something. So um, I aim to help children and where they talk about, you know, healthy coping mm-hmm. and not just grieving and, you know, dealing with the pain, trying to hide their trauma. But it gets hard because even me right now, like I'm going through a lot and I don't, you know, I don't use the tools that I'm teaching children. So mm-hmm. it's just like it takes a time. It takes a while. I feel like, you know, um, it does take time, you know, you allow yourself to process it, you know, you heal. But, you know, I was going to ask a question and I was wondering, you know, what made you allow, what allowed you to open up about what you experienced? I think it's because people look at me like literally not just my family, but my entire community. And it's bigger than my community, too. I I, I know a lot of people in D.C. like that's in our generation. Um just because we all do like social media is a big form like a big platform in our society and I think that everyone looks at me like because I went to Penn State and because I like I have dinner with you know Michelle Obama or Barack Obama spoke about me at Penn State I mean at Banneker all these highlighted things are you know they they are good I'm proud of them but Mm -hmm. that's not really like that's not, you know, that's not me. That's not just all of me. Like I go through things, like mm-hmm. actual things. I think it's very easy for people to, you know, see your resume or see your com- like your accomplishments and say her life is perfect. Like, no. I've probably been through more stuff than you, but I just try to, you know, like move forward. Like life goes on. And it's sad to say that life goes on, but I feel like I've been I kind of made what happens in Southeast normal. And it was always normal to me until I got away to Penn State and realized like, whoa, y'all don't go through that? Like, mm-hmm. that's not normal? And I feel like that was what made me come back home to DC. Like, guys, we don't live a normal life. Like, this is not the way we are supposed to live. Mm-hmm. Like, let's not, you know, I don't want to, if I have children, I'm probably not gonna have children, but <laughs> if I have my nieces and nephews and like my little cousins, I don't want them to realize, I mean, I don't want them to think that, you know, everything that we see in our grandparents and our aunts and uncles who, they live a pretty good life, but, it's not, that's not it. That's not the highest you can go. Like, mm-hmm. and even with me, I want to get my doctor degree, but you can be better than me. Like, this is just my point, but I want them to go so far beyond. So I think that's why I'm so open, just because I really dislike when people say, oh, Mar, you got it good. Like, no, I don't. <laughs> like, yeah. I be stressed out too. Yeah. In the hospital beds, visiting my dad, like, it'd be a, you know. It's painful. It, it is. Mm-hmm. And another question I'm thinking about, just because, you know, a lot of people are looking at you, they're watching you, you know, people want to be like you and, you know, because, you know, I think admiration can sometimes, you know, go the wrong direction because Mm -hmm. you get this uh, really singular message, like you were saying. But for those like young people out there who are really looking at you as a true inspiration, how did you get started in all of this? What advice would you give to them? That's a good question. That's a little deep. (laughs) I think um, there's a lot of different factors that I feel like, you know, push me into this direction. I think first and foremost, like, when I mentioned I wanted to give up, that was was true. Like, I didn't take my medicine. Mm -hmm. I didn't didn't call my doctors. Like, I wanted to give up really badly because I was exhausted and I was tired. And that's pain. I haven't done with that since I was two years old, mm-hmm. but it's when I got into those years that you start to do stuff with your friends that it really affected me, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Because yeah. when I'm five and I'm sick, all right, I don't know what else to do anyway, <laughs> yeah. but you know, like when I'm in middle school and I'm missing all everything because I just had a heart surgery. So it's like, my mom is super worried, you know, she's in her mother mode, you're not going anywhere without me. Like, I never stayed over anybody's house ever, mm-hmm. not even my dad's, my dad's in my life really heavily, but, it was always, if I'm not with my mom and my grandma, then like, I'm, yeah, I'm not nowhere. Going. Like, and my grandma, she lives with me and my mom, so it's not like I was outside of my mom's eyesight at all, honestly. And I now, when I look back, I appreciate that. I used to be so upset, like, mom, I'm, I'm alive. Like, I still gotta do something. But I feel like in those moments when I did get sick and I was away, I probably would panic. Like, I know what to do, but I probably would not be mm-hmm. able to think about it in the moment. So I'm glad that my mom was, you know, like that. Um, I think another thing is honestly myself, like if I'm honest with you, I think I had to like, you know, be the one to just try to do something different. And I was exposed to a lot of things. I was 
Like in my middle school and in my high school, I was always just talking to people. I'm a very social person. So just honestly talking to people mm -hmm. can get you at a lot of places. Yeah. I think that one thing that I dislike about that, though, is that some people come into your life with these big plans and then they don't be consistent. Like mm -hmm. we see that a lot in our community. They come in with these nice programs and their yeah. pictures for their social media platforms. And it's just like two months later when you're really going through something, you know, they're gone. Like mm -hmm. they don't come back and visit. So. I think that just seeing my community, I just really want change in it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of it at all. Mm -hmm. To see my brother, like, witness his dad. I think that was definitely, like, the biggest factor in it mm -hmm. because when my stepfather was murdered, um, we told my younger brother stuff like, oh, he's in, he's in the sky with God. He's sleeping. He looked like he's sleeping when you see him. And that was not a good thing to tell children because they're really smart like we got on the plane and dj was like oh we're gonna see dad we're like no, it doesn't work like that you know what yeah. i mean like he's not gonna wake up you cannot facetime him like it was so many questions that he will ask and it's just like you know and i could never go to my mom about that that pain that i was caused by from my stepfather because that was you know her significant other and she was grieving and then my brother was grieving so I feel like I had to be there for them yeah. and it's just like I needed my dad to be there yeah. but I never told him that because I'm just like he already feels bad for leaving me and I'm just like oh dad I needed you in that moment you know yeah. what I mean so, you had to carry all the way and, right like it didn't affect me like he was a part of my life way before my little brother's life you know what I mean like I had the best of both worlds like my brother father was very involved in my life so yeah. Sucks. I actually have a question for you, Elias, like in relationship to Amari. Mm -hmm. You know, in your own episode, you talked about, you know, being incarcerated and the effect it had on you and hearing that Amari's dad was incarcerated, you know, two men being in a system. If you had to give Amari any kind of like advice on how to connect with her dad on a deeper level and, you know, have these hard conversations because in the black community or any you know community at all it's hard to have those conversations mm -hmm. what advice would you give her well um first i would like to say you know i, I feel bad you know i'm sorry that you had to go to <gasps> don't feel bad because i know i, <laughs> I don't know, need any sympathy <laughs> i know it's not easy going through um Thank emotions you, and trying to open up especially like you said you know it feels it's hard to open up and people assume that you have everything. Mm -hmm. but sometimes your world be, may be tearing, tearing down. Um, and I know you must be strong for that, you know, to keep pushing forward. Um, I would like to say that the best way you can open up to your father, uh, as a male, as I speak, um, I would say that it just, um, it's just opening up, be yourself, mm -hmm. you know. I know it may seem like very blunt, mm -hmm. but Sometimes you just have to get it out there and be like, look, it, it, I'm going through this and it's been on my mind for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I just want to open up to you, you know, be um, straightforward. Cause I know, I know we may not, we may seem tough outside, mm -hmm. you know, but inside we're still humans, you know. That's we still like got me emotions. right now. <laughs> like, honestly, every, even when you just spoke, um, when you said I'm so strong, like I am exhausted. I am tired. Like, mm -hmm. if I could take a break for like from work, from school, from family, and everything for just a day, I would do it. Like, but I always feel like I have this fear of failure. Like, I just always feel like I gotta keep going. I gotta keep going because I don't know why I try to wear so many capes on my back. Like, if I don't do it, who gonna do it? And that's mm -hmm. a bad way to live because I'm like, Mari, it's not about you. You know what I mean? And I think, and as far as your question about that conversation with my father. I do want to talk to him about it, but I feel like I'm so worried about my father not being ready. Like, yeah. my dad feels bad for leaving. And even now, like, he's like, I'm looking up to you. I'm like, Dad, I look up to you. Mm -hmm. Like, I understand you made your mistakes. You know, that's, I understand that. Like, even after my dad's incarceration, um, I still don't see him as a bad man. When it was like the newspapers, the big courts, I'm just like, I don't want to go back to that. Like, I don't want to hear them talking to talk about my dad in that type of way because that's not the man that I know. Like, mm -hmm. my dad brings me flowers. He gives me hugs. Like, he picks me up in the car, open the door. Like, that's what I know of him. That's what I know how a man to be. Like, mm -hmm. so little stuff like that, I just, oh, I don't like it. But honestly, like, right now, I just wish I can tell my parents that, like, 
I know you guys think you have a perfect child. Like, you know, they brag on me a lot. And I'm appreciative of that. Like, don't yeah. get me wrong. I do. But sometimes I want my parents to just realize that, like, it would be nice to just take a little backpack off me right quick and, like, understand mm -hmm. that, one, I just now got into adulthood. Like, I'm not even a real adult yet. You know, mm -hmm. I'm... I'm tired, like, life is extremely exhausting. And I feel like we just live in these communities where the chains do not pop if nobody's gonna pop mm -hmm. them. Like, yeah. my dad was incarcerated and it's just like, he comes home to what? Like, he he's on 24 hour house arrest, so what can he really do? Like, mm -hmm. he can't, I mean, he can get a job, but where? Like, at exactly. a warehouse, like, it's hard to trans to transition from a person that lives a, a nice life, you know what I mean? To just go into, you make nothing, like nothing for most of these jobs. And you got to work for 50 years just to be comfortable. Like, I don't want to live that type of life where I need to retire when I'm 80. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want that. And I feel like my dad did that because he just, that's all he knew, you know what I mean? Like, who told him, all right, when you go to school, this is what you'll do, and then you'll do this and you'll do that. Like, it's not really talked about in our communities. Nobody really do that, uh, especially for males. It's just like that's nobody yeah, talk about that. that so it's just like I wish I can teach my dad, you know, ways to just one be open, like <laughs> just to be open to try new things. You know what I mean? Like my dad's he's trying to do businesses that just make him rich in ten minutes, like buying trucks. I mean, those are smart things, but it's okay to, you know, take it slow, take it slow a little bit, you yeah. know, so it can be the right way so it doesn't fall in six months. Like you want it to at least be 10 years and then you can settle down yeah. and retire. Like, yeah. I also, you know, have a hard time talking to my parents, whether it's my mom who was always there mm -hmm. or my dad who really wasn't. And, you know, I feel for you because when I talk about my parents, I always tell people I'm the replica of my dad. Like we think the same way, we move the same way. But then it's like my mom, that's been my support for the longest. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have, you know, a closer bond with any of them. And, you know, people are like, well, you, you know, you should tell them these things. And I'm just like, you know, it, it hurts because I'm the younger one. I don't want to have to tell grown people how mm -hmm. to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And I want to heal my inner child by having it. And I want to just, you know, act like a child and just communicate. And I think we're really desiring to go back to that place of, you know, not having responsibilities and just being a kid with our parents mm -hmm. and, you know, just talking, like talking is so therapeutic, but because we've grown up and we've did everything ourselves and we've been independent, not only is there no time to go back to that child because it's money to be made, it's legacies to be built, and it's, you know, you I have agree. things to do. Like, it's just so hard, and I feel for that. And it's also something that I'm going through. So no matter if it's your parents being incarcerated or you're being, well, not you're being homeless, but you are homeless, you know, it's a struggle for everyone. Even mm -hmm. if you have, like, the best life, communication is really hard. You yeah. can be the you, the best speaker to a big audience, but communicating right. with those closest to you that takes another level of maturity and comfort. Mm -hmm. I agree. Also, um, I understand that, you know, your father, you say your father comes home and finding a job is not easy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something important that, you know, that needs to be stated is that, um, is that, it, you know, when we come home from being locked up or something, they expect us to just find a job easily or continue with our society, just like if yeah. nothing happened. In reality, my dad couldn't even get an ID for a while because yeah. he didn't exactly. have his birth certificate or social security card or something mm -hmm. like that. So I'm like, mm. like he had to do that whole process exactly. over. It was just a lot. And, and and the worst part is is that, um, they just want us to you know to continue our lives like come like mm -hmm. if it was nothing, you know, like if it was nothing, and it hurts us deeply inside because at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to show that we are improving but at the same time how can we improve when we don't give the option we don't get the option to yeah. continue what we was doing before yeah i agree i just think that um a lot of government officials and people of you know the systems that the correctional system it just needs a little re and 
maybe we should just get rid of it all and then start yeah. over from scratch because it needs work. You know what I mean? Like it needs work. Yeah. It doesn't realize the trauma that it does to not only the inmate, but the inmate's family and everyone that's around them. Um, like not even just my dad, but I just see incarceration a lot mm-hmm. um, in my family, mm-hmm. like as a whole. They're just, good thing my dad was not like in and out at least he wasn't when I was born. He was prior to my birth. But my family, um, like I see them, and even my friends that I'm like close with, you know what I mean? Like they are incarcerated and they just kind of live like it's normal. Then they come home and they're just like, a few months later, they're back in there again. So it's mm-hmm. just like, are you guys going to fix the problem? Are you in there to come home and you know do something differently? But I think it's a lot of work that needs to be done. Yeah. One question I have for you, because you do a lot of work with incarceration, how would you change the process of release and reintegrating into society? Because I know for me, like one avenue I want to work on is where do incarcerated people go or Mm -hmm. where do they get a house if they don't have family? Right. They end up on the street and then, you know, we create this stigma that homeless people are criminals or they're lazy or they're poor and they just want you know mm-hmm. to do all these negative things but we don't have systems in place to make them feel human again so that's how i really want to branch out but for you you know what's that branching out looking like for you or you know what advice do you have for these politicians or not even politicians but you know policy makers yeah. and people with genuine hearts who want to change? Um, I would definitely say that life is simple. Like people make it so So complicated and it don't have to be that way. Like simply ask a question, like, do you have an ID? Like, are you able to get an ID? You know, Mm -hmm. where are you gonna go? Like you said, like, who are you gonna go home with? It's like, if you got, you know, if you had a hip replacement surgery, they're not gonna just discharge you to the streets. Like, you gotta make sure that you have a home. If not, they're gonna put you in some type of, you know, like recovery home to people that help you because that's a big adjustment, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you gotta, who's gonna make your food? Who's gonna change your clothes? Mm -hmm. So with this, I feel like it should be, you know, where are you gonna go? Mm -hmm. Who's gonna help you? Do you have a job in mind? Like, what field are you interested in? How's your mental health? Like, do you want to be connected with this and this services? Because one thing I've learned was that in D.C., there's a lot of resources, but people don't tell you about them. It's all like, about accessibility. Exactly. There's this thing. Um, if you have, like, D.C. health insurance, like Medicare, Medicaid, any of the free insurances, mm-hmm. you can get free mental health services, like counseling, therapy, medication, day rehab, like, why not tell people that who actually need it? You know what I mean? Like, And I want to thank you for bringing attention to that and being part of the process of, you know, spreading information to those who may not know, because honestly, we have these services, but if it's not servicing the people that need it, that why it. do we have it to begin with? Yeah, that's like my big thing that I'm trying to do with the, like my career goal, mm-hmm. trying to like feel like we live on different sides of the river with mm-hmm. like the people who make the hospitals, they make the rules, the people who does the law rules and the policies, and then it's like the communities that are in need for like the testings and the resources. Like mm-hmm. who's gonna cross the river? Like you want the people who can barely who's survive gonna, to get in the water and messages. like drown, or are y'all willing to get in the water? So I kind of want to be like, all right, I'm gonna create this bridge here. Everybody's gonna walk in the middle and they're <laughs> yeah. gonna meet. And then that's when life is gonna get better for us all. It's not gonna happen today or tomorrow, but. I got a little years to make this do it. As long as you lay that foundation for me. Yeah. Yeah. Then people that come on later down in life can, you know, can continue to build it and grow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Amari, for sharing with us. Thank Thank you. you guys. And now you know. Hello, everyone. My name is Amari McDuffie. And now that you know, please share your story. Your story matters and is just as valid. If you would like resources, please check us out on our website. We have peer support groups. You can get that on our website or DM us on Instagram. We also offer mentors. You can do it virtually. Um, Join us. And if you are a teacher or professor, please visit our educator resource group. Um, We have a website, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all of the platforms. We're here. We want you to join us. Please come out. Thank you.